I am convinced that there is nowhere you could be today that is any more important than this. There is no issue in front of us that is any more critical uh, than the issue of climate change, uh, critical to the, to the future of life on, on Earth as we know it. Climate change is like that uh, thief in the night that, that comes while we're sleeping in and takes away everything that is, is most precious to us. Finally, we're beginning to uh, uh, awaken to the realities, to the truth, to the science. Although that awakening is coming slowly and it's coming with a fair amount of reluctance, um, but it's our, our children and our youth, uh, in, my, in my opinion, who are leading us today in, in this awareness, dawning awareness of, of climate change and its, its impact. And, and your role is to give them the tools they need, the truth, the science, and to instill in them the passion and the belief that they can, that they can make a difference, that they can do anything and everything to turn this. When you understand the, the nature of climate change, when you understand its drivers, its impacts, its embedded multipliers that hastening the warming of the planet and the extinction of, of species. It's easy to understand why people become depressed, withdrawn, enter into denial over, over the, the, the challenge that lies before us. But you wouldn't be here today if you weren't hopeful people, if you didn't believe that you could make a difference. And I wouldn't be any kind of a plenary opener if I didn't believe with every fiber of my being that we can change the trajectory on this warming of our planet and that we can restore life on Earth to a state of a unity and, and balance. At, at age 70, I'm recognizing that this is multi-generational work. It doesn't happen overnight, but it has to start today. It has to start with urgency today, and it has to start with you. So why am I optimistic? I was a baby mayor in 2004 when I was joined by 19 other mayors from around the country uh, for three days at uh, Sundance, Utah, to begin a, developing a strategy for cities to address a global warming. I, I knew very little about the subject. I hadn't, hadn't yet registered for me as a new mayor uh, on the list of critical issues like garbage collection and pothole filling and neighborhood law enforcement and protection. What did climate change, global warming, have to do with me anyway? It was underwritten entirely by the U.S. Conference of Mayors and the Robert Redford Institute. And, and so off I went to a fun junk, junk in a beautiful place uh, in uh, our country, Sunday at Utah. I was soon to learn that these three days would change my life, would redefine my understanding of my leadership and my role as a leader of a city and send me in a direction of scholarship that was uh, previously unknown to me. Joining us at Sundance was Vice President Al Gore, just a little more than two years after he had uh, been defeated at the hands of the Supreme Court uh, in his bid for the presidency. Uh, Al Gore had immersed himself in the science of climate change global warming, as we call it then. And he put together a little slideshow, as he called it. We watched the show, and we spent hours talking with the Vice President, Robert Redford, and with the scientists the conference had assembled uh, for the 20 of us. 
We walk the trails around Sundance and, and uh, in twos and threes and talking earnestly about what we were learning and about the difference that it was going to make and the way we led our cities. And to a person, this group of 20 mayors left that conference sober, clear-eyed, and convinced that we were the advance guard to protect the planet. Of course, that little slideshow of the vice presidents became the basis for the film, An Inconvenient Truth. Gore received the Nobel Peace Prize and a generation of climate deniers arose to challenge us climate evangelists. We 20 mayors rolled up our sleeves when we got home and got to work. And, and perhaps you know about some of the work that happened here in our own city of, of Grand Rapids, the setting and achieving of 20% renewable energy goal by the year 2008. Resetting that goal as the first city in Michigan and one of a handful in the nation to set a 100% renewable energy goal for municipal power demand by the year 2025. Uh, currently, we're at about 34 to 36%. And when Mayor Bliss's biodigester comes online uh, here uh, very shortly, that will take another leap up. And the project that I started planning that is back on the drawing boards again, the, uh, a solar display, a 38-acre solar display at the Butterworth Landfill, former Butterworth Landfill. When those come online, we continue to move aggressively toward that 100% goal. We've developed and have continuously improved our public transportation system, the RAPID. Maybe some of you wrote the 50 out here this morning. Downtown Grand Rapids, Grand Valley. What's the number? Yumi, is it like 3 million rides or something that, that the RAPID provides for GBSU students alone coming back and forth to campus to Grand Rapids? Uh, the introduction of, of energy efficiency standards in, in all of our city building, the installation on some of those buildings of, of solar uh, displays, uh, rooftop solar displays, and, and on firehouses of geothermal heating and cooling systems. The transition of the, the city fleet from dirty diesel fuel to clean fuels of electric and natural gas, compressed natural gas, and our commitment to stormwater management managing the rain where it falls instead of putting it into the gray system and allowing it to go straight out to the river, which causes uh, additional flooding in, during extreme rain events. Those are some of the things we, we have done in Grand Rapids, but it's not that alone that gives me optimism and gives me hope. On December 4th, 2015, in the Paris City Hall, at the invitation of Paris Mayor Anne Hidalgo and former New York Mayor Michael Bloomberg, 600 mayors of the world gathered. It coincided with, or coinciding with, the climate accords that were happening at the Bourget on the northeast side of, of Paris. The day was perhaps one of the most inspiring inspiring days and, and that I have ever experienced. We knew that if the accords that were being drafted across town were to become meaningful, that if they were to achieve the most aggressive goal of no more than 1.5 degree Celsius increase over pre-industrial levels, it would only be to the extent that cities implement uh, strategies like those that I've just described to you. Strategies around energy and transportation and building design and heat island reduction, the planting of, of trees, and the protection of wetlands and, and parklands. In other words, we understood that 
success of the international agreement depended on us, depended on cities. The inspiration of that day flavored by my entire attitude, flavored rather my entire attitude toward the Paris Climate Accords that were achieved. Uh, that day, we, as mayors, we talked about what we'd done in our city. We, we proposed solutions. We challenged each other. We bragged because that's what mayors do. We encouraged one another to do more. We caucused and we convinced. We, and, and, and I can tell you that to the person, those 600 mayors left Paris energized, confident that the progress that we would achieve in cities all over the globe would help realize and actualize the, the, uh, the, uh, the climate agreements. We knew that there was nothing, nothing that could stand against the power of this movement. And then we had a change of U.S. administration, and that which seemed impossible happened. We elected a climate denier as president of the United States. And he promptly put other climate deniers in, in key positions in his administration. And an and early order of business in this slash and burn administration was to withdraw the U.S. from the Paris Climate Accords and to make us actually the first rogue nation. Withdrawal isn't as simple as saying, we're out of here. There's a process, and that process takes time. But effectively, the parallel rollback by the administration of uh, Obama-era uh, uh, executive orders is permitting a, a business-as-usual polluting approach. And, and the lack of enforcement at the EPA virtually guarantees that by the time we finally uh, withdraw from Paris, we will already be far down the road toward violating our voluntary goals. The finding of the Obama-era executive orders is, is particularly distressing to me as I spent uh, just over a year on the president's uh, task force of eight governors, 14 mayors, and two tribal leaders working on the, the very policies uh, around uh, um, community resiliency and to climate change that the president ordered using his executive authority. But still, and as I stand before you today, I remain optimistic. Uh, why? Because before uh, Trump announced the withdrawal from Paris, business was already well down the road toward building a cleaner future. And, and while some will turn back and retrace their steps to a, a, a dirtier time, others will not. Secondly, um, lenders are beginning to refuse to make loans to those companies that are, that are in the business of creating pollution, uh, air pollution. And, in, and insurance companies are beginning to deny requests for insurance in areas that are prone to the, the impacts of climate change, uh, where large concentrations of population are living along coastlines or in, uh, in, 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 in drought affected areas where they might be subject to, to fire. Third, I'm optimistic because uh, the citizens of America, people like uh, you and me, have been conscientized to the, the challenge before us and the purchasing decisions that we're making and the political votes and the public advocacy that we're, that we're doing is being driven by our new understanding of where we are with respect to the damage uh, to our planet. I'm encouraged because people like you care enough to be here today. And because people like you are teaching our children and our youth the, the truth and the science of climate change. Uh, that gives me encouragement and hope. Dr. John Holdren um, was, the, was the director of the 
Obama White House Office of Science and Technology, position that the incumbent president has not filled, said this, if we want to avoid the catastrophic effects surrounding climate change, we have got to turn this problem around now. And, and even since he said that, we've set records for global average temperatures in 2016, 2017, and 2018. Friends, uh, John Holdren's challenge is directed at us. It's a challenge to how we live, how we do our business, how we respect the earth, how we value our children's children and their future, how we think, how we act, how we vote. It's easy to look at the magnitude of the challenge before us and, and conclude that nothing can be done to reverse this phenomenon or that our small contribution doesn't make a difference. But in his powerful encyclical on climate change, Pope Francis wrote this, what would induce any, what would induce anyone at this stage to hold on to power only to be remembered for their inability to take action when it was urgent and necessary to do so? What would induce anyone? But Pope's words serve as a reminder to leaders at all levels of government and every nation of the world uh, that they must not squander the important political capital that they have that they've uh, amassed. But I would conclude that his today by saying that each of us is in a position of relative power, and thus each of us has a responsibility to act. Each of us have had our eyes open to the plight of the planet. We've heard Earth's cry. We know the historic rate of species extinction. We've seen the suffering of humanity in climate's bullseye. We can't claim ignorance, neither can we rest until, uh, rest rather, on our past accomplishments. Last August, with my youngest grandson, Gabriel, I canoed the Muskegon River from its uh, source at Houghton Lake to its mouth in Muskegon. Um, we paddled over crystal clear water past uh, shorelines uh, filled with fir and, and, and cedar and occasionally punctuated by towering uh, ancient white pine trees. We saw eagles and osprey, a fox, deer, beaver, mink, muskrats. And my commitment deepened as the air, fresh and crisp in the morning, said, thank you. And the soil under the white pines, uh, spongy and sweet smelling, said, you must do more. And the water, cold and clear said, the universe will give you all you need, the strength, the courage, the wisdom. And the eagle said, don't be afraid. Friends, we know the way, the way to save the planet. It's up to us to go there.